you know, SEAL teams and special operations teams in general, I don't know to what degree, you're on the inside of it, right? But there, you hold this special sort of ethos or this special sort of mythos, I think, in the American imagination. And, you know, what, what we read about you are like the stories in Vanity Fair where like somebody is stuck, kidnapped in some hellhole by some group in the middle of Africa. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, you guys basically sweep in like angels and take this American citizen to safety or whatever. You know, all the, it's not just like the war zone stuff. I think Americans have this other sort of view of you guys as sort of like America's guardian angels in many ways, sort of, you know, all around the world. But I wonder what you would say about, you know, this form of consciousness, this state of consciousness, this type of consciousness, and whether like you could absolutely never do that kind of job and be in it or whether it's ideal for it, or whether there are certain forms of it, certain types of it that are ideal for it, or have you guys, you must have talked about that or thought about that. I wonder what you'd say. That's a great question. Oh man, how much time you got? Funny, yeah, funny story. Two Seals. And a walrus. Hey, welcome to Two Seals and a Walrus. I am Sean Webb. Okay, so today we have another interview for you. And because we just forget to do cool stuff like official show introductions, etc. So here I am doing the introduction for you. Today's guest is Dr. Jeffrey Martin, who is a specialist and a scientist who studies consciousness expansion, enlightenment, and he does it with like all kinds of technical gear in a lab and the ability for the mind to change and become more in a state of permanent well-being. And he's also one of the founding fathers of the transformational technology movement and helped put together that conference out in California where they start zapping your brain with different waves and different electrodes and things like that. And really cool technology that can assist people in increasing their memory, increasing their consciousness, increasing their well-being. And he's one of the experts in that space. So we kind of got so excited to talk to him that we forgot to do a show intro. So here we go. <laughs> okay, and so with no further ado, <laughs> here is Dr. Jeff Martin. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great. Great to be with you. Excellent. So you are an expert. How would you explain your expertise? You you kind of dabble in a lot of things, but you're into consciousness expansion in a very unique way. Well, I don't know how unique it is. I think we're into consciousness expansion in a very general way. We might be the broadest generalists out there. From the narrow perspective of things like enlightenment, non-duality, persistent mystical experience, unitive consciousness, stuff like that. Things that we call academically persistent non-symbolic experience or publicly fundamental well-being. So I'll probably use the term fundamental well-being for all of that today. And that's what I mean when I say that. Um, okay. So if you think about that as being very specific within the field of consciousness, then yeah, we are hyper-focused on that. And uh, we've researched it for 12 years. We basically have the largest research project out there in it. Um, we have protocol with probably the most successful protocol that transitions people to it. We help people to integrate it these days. We do a lot of research. Most of our, most of our research these days is on integration of it. You know, how does it unfold for you after the fact and that kind of thing. Uh, but on the other side, because I, we actually don't think it's that hard to get to. Um, right. But it is hard to figure out how to get large numbers of people to, you know. So we, our program, we have a, our experimental protocol is basically like four months long. And some people will transition on the first day. Some people will transition on the last day. You know, it's sort of like just who knows, you know, when somebody is going to have their transition occur. 70% of people have it occur for them. So it's pretty successful as things go. Um, yeah. But that's not going to scale, right? So we also work on technologies for this. Um, as we make this video, actually, I just ducked out of a meeting happening in the other room here um, where we're talking about getting that research to China and to Beijing and looking at what the logistics are of that and all of that. And so that's direct brain stimulation type stuff. Wow. We literally try to zap the spots in the brain that have been shown in, in prior research that we uh, collaborated on and, you know, have collaborators and friends that did, um, you know, identified the regions of interest in the brain. Um, and so now we finally have a technology that allows us to reach in and sort of tickle those. Uh, I was one of the founders basically behind the transformative technology movement, which is just broadly technology and well-being, you know, 70 countries at this point, hundreds of cities, all that stuff. But I think, I think really my personal passion 
and why I started the transformative technology movement is all around this this fundamental well-being stuff. Awesome. Now, for the folks who are brand new to this, would it be fair to say that your your work in transformative technology is basically building tech that helps people have a consciousness expansion or psychedelic experiences without the exogenous psychedelics, without any drugs. Is that fair to say? I wouldn't say psychedelic uh, because we're really interested in persistent forms of, you know, the maximum sort of well-being that people can right. experience, uh, which uh -huh. is not necessarily an accurate description of uh, many psychedelic experiences. <laughs> um, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, but with that caveat, yeah, sure. our work, our personal, my personal work in technology is right. around that. The wider transformative technology space is really, I mean, you know, our conferences have been sponsored by people like Google and Deloitte and you know, folks like that, major VC firms. And, uh, and so it really is the broader space of right. well-being and technology. So would this be connected with the science of flow and kind of making that a longer term persistent existence? You could think about that. You know, I saw my friend Jamie Wheel a couple of days ago. We were both speaking at the same conference <coughs> this weekend. Uh, so it was always a treat to see him. And he's probably one of the main, he and Stephen Kotler, his partner, are probably, you know, the major public advocates out there for flow. His book, Stealing Fire, has, you know, done a lot in the flow space and the psychedelic space and sort of all of that. Um, so... He and I have a have kind of a disagreement about this, actually. You know, he's really into sort of temporary states of flow. And we've had, we even just on one of his podcasts recently had kind of a debate back and forth about our view of this, which is that, you know, there that there's a sort of a persistent life flow state that's possible that, you know, we would definitely classify in the fundamental well-being bucket. Uh, and he's really more of, and he and Steven are really more of state specific flow type people, you know, where there's tasks involved. And so whether it's, you know, sports flow or creativity flow, or I suppose for, you know, your co-hosts there, um, uh, sort of the group mind thing that, um, mm -hmm. you know, that I don't know if I should say who did it, but there's some interesting research that comes out of San Diego and a research outfit down there that's done a lot of work with uh, Navy SEAL teams and stuff like that to try to understand the EEG of uh, what's happening when they sort of get into their shared mind or their group mind, or I don't remember, they have a term for it. I don't remember what the term is. Um, that Team type of thing. And so that's really sort of different, I think, than what we do. We're looking for persistence. You know, we're looking for persistent forms of this stuff. Now, is that what your book, The Finders, was all about? Because it, it seems like you you kind of delineated a, a you know a classification, I guess, of a, a number of different levels of persistence and, you know, for lack of a better term, you know, awakening that individuals can can experience on a long term basis. And I thought it was a, an amazing book, by the way. And I know Ben over here is a fan of this book as well because. Um, he was, yeah, he was, <laughs> yeah, he, uh, he read it and he was like, oh my God, I understand this stuff so much better now. Is that what your book, The Finders is all about is kind of trying to delineate and, and put uh, scientific measurement to these types of, of, you know, persistent states? It really is. And that book is actually for people who experience it, even though, you know, it's obviously going to be very popular with seekers and stuff. It just came out. Because uh, seekers are always trying to get like every last little bit of information that they can get, thinking that like a little bit more information will help their brain understand it, and somehow magically they'll be able to get there or something. Which they right. Sort of opposite of, right. Right. Uh, they should not be building these mental models that they will never be able to inhabit about this in their head. They should <laughs> I'm so glad you said that. Them there. <laughs> so, so the book was really uh, I wanted. It's our first major publication. And I wanted it to be in service to the people who had taken so much time out of their lives, you know, to participate in our research over the years. And so that book was basically written over uh, about a 10 year period. Uh, hundreds of people read it before it was released to the public. I didn't you know, I have a, uh, my friend Ken Wilbur, who's very popular in the space and has written a lot of books and stuff. Um, I didn't want to repeat sort of the same pattern that Ken did. And what Ken did was he, you know, he sort of 
thought about stuff and then wrote about it in real time and put it out and then thought about more stuff and wrote about it and put it out. And so now people talk about, you know, there's sort of Wilbur's thought periods of like Wilbur 1 and Wilbur 2 and Wilbur 3 and Wilbur 4. <laughs> I didn't want there to be like Martin 1, Martin 2, Martin 3, Martin 4. You know, I felt like I really wanted to wait until I was pretty sure that there wasn't going to be some massive revision that was needed. And so that took really 10 years and a lot of iteration. Um, for it to get out there. So it's for people who are really in and experiencing this. And it's also for them to be able to hand it to the people in their lives and say, see, I'm not the only one. See, I'm not right. really that weird. You know, I don't need psychiatric help necessarily, you know, <laughs> or any of that. Because that's what happens, right? When you have a transition like this, you go and you tell your spouse or your kids or your best friend or whatever. And it right. just sounds so unusual to them that they worry it about you. Yeah, they uh, think so you're crazy. It would be really mm -hmm. helpful to have a book from, you know, a guy with decent credentials from a from a academic standpoint and whatnot saying, Okay, there's nothing wrong here. These are actually the sort of the greatest states of human well being. They're places that really we should all probably be trying to get to. Right. Though certainly not everyone's attracted to them. Uh, so that's the yeah, that's basically the story. This that's the that's a, it's a fantastic, I think, compendium, first of its kind, really. I knew I was writing it for posterity. You know, I knew it was going to be sort of like William Stace's book, um, which was so influential. It created the modern mysticism academy in the psychology of religion space and, and all of that. And I had a feeling that this was going to be sort of a book like that, very much like sort of Maslow's books were to peak experience. And so I just wanted to make sure that it was as good as it could possibly be before it came out. It was kind of interesting because it was the first book I've written to not become a bestseller. <laughs> you know, if you look at our fiction yeah. books and our previous books and stuff, they all kind of climbed the charts and did really well during their period in the sun. Uh, and I just knew I was going to release this one and it was just going to, you know, not go anywhere. In it's a tough topic. Yeah. yeah. It is a tough topic. It's not a topic that a lot of people can understand because they can't relate to it, it frankly. Even the ones that can still kind of don't understand. That's the point. Yeah, yeah it's right. Like, it's so, such, such a delicate topic. Yeah, there's some people that are going to read it or that are going to be on the spectrum, on a lower spectrum, and not understand the higher, um, I don't know, levels of attainment or whatever you want to call them. That you know, like you, you talk about um, being able to shift fluidly from multiple levels of consciousness back and forth, which is like a whole extra level within itself. And there are going to be a lot of people who just start kind of stuck in their spot that don't be that aren't able to relate to and so even within the the target audience they're going to be at people i believe who c things land with and then some of them are going to be like well what you know i didn't i didn't really consider that or know about that how much of that like what what level of um like if you had to to create a kind of a a, a bell curve so to speak where would you say most of the people that you're working with fall on the various spectrums that you that you put out in your book and uh, the finders? Well, for the vast majority of time, they fell in locations one through four. We, we can think of it, if, you haven't, if you're not familiar with this, uh, types of it. So you can, when I say location, you can kind of substitute type. Uh, if right. Watching this. Um, and so, you know, the vast majority of them are really in locations one and two. Okay. And then down there, three. And then down from that, you know, four is getting pretty darn rare. Uh, right. And then to go beyond four is much more rare still. And so these days who we work with are primarily the people who are beyond four because we're, we're working in that sort of later, rare, even more rare territory. And, and the vast majority of people that you meet, they're in locations one and two. And, you know, I think one of the things that we want to say about this right up front is that later is not necessarily better. Right. Uh, and so yeah. I, there's this, you know, it's funny, right? Because there's this um, ethos out there that's, uh, that's like pedal to the metal, you know, just right. like go as far as you possibly can. And you hate first and your last. That, yeah, exactly. <laughs> our view of that is very different. You know, we really think that um, these are very useful for different people in different places in life or whatever. So the fact that most people are in location one and down from that location two, I think is wonderful because that's a highly functional place within this. Yeah. So I personally keep myself right around the end of location two yeah. because that's just such a remark. You know, I have a lot of stuff going on. I need to live a very high functional integrated <laughs> with ordinary people kind of life. Yeah, could you explain briefly, like just a quick breakdown? You don't have to go deeply into these things, but basically just a delineation of what the different levels represent, 
or what the type of um, uh, characteristics are for, um, you know, because like the, a lot of the people who are listening to this podcast are going to not even be familiar with consciousness expansion ideas at all. Like they're going to be believing that the mess of their mind and the things that they get from their mind, including their emotional reactions and things like that, are simply who they are. And they won't be able to understand that there is a consciousness beyond that where, you know, even if, you know, you you, in, you introduce the idea of being able to take their mind and look back on their mind, they, they don't make the equation that being able to look at something at a distance basically defines the fact that you're more than that thing because you have to have distance between the observer and the observed. So they won't even get that. But then they won't definitely won't understand that there are multiple levels of consciousness expansion that can occur within the human mind. Could you break down for us the the quick delineations of the four different levels? Yeah, absolutely. And let me talk a little bit before that about sort of what changes in general. Okay. Because if you think about what changes in general, there's one thing that runs across all of these locations. And I think of it almost as an evolutionary progression. So if you think about um, Maslow's work, for instance, Maslow talked a lot about peak experiences. And right. he's, everybody's familiar with Maslow's pyramid, which, by the way, he didn't mm -hmm. make. Uh, right. That was made by someone else. Tell me. The thing that made him super <laughs> famous to this day was done by, like, some business professor just thinking a business book or something. <laughs> it doesn't necessarily accurately represent his views. Right. Uh, but he did definitely feel that people were progressing towards a self-actualized level. And that is like when you are like the greatest individual that you can be, you know, right. and you have like just, you are just rocking it as an individual. But there was an interesting paradox within that. And the paradox was that some people within that level um, had experiences, you know, peak experiences, essentially, these experiences that seemed to take them beyond what was the individual experience of themselves? You know, people talk about looking at a beautiful sunset and it's like they just dissolve into the experience or Jamie and Stevens flow state stuff where, you know, people will jump off of bridges with rubber bands tied to their ankles just for like a momentary glimpse beyond sort of this tightly wound narrative, you know, traditionally egoic sort of sense of self to have that sort of dissolve and have a moment where they're free of it um, and things like that, right? And so Maslow had this strange paradox and that in the top level of his sort of developmental hierarchy, he had people who seemed to go beyond themselves and people who didn't. And it seemed like you could be sort of maximally developed as a human being and have either had that experience or not had that experience. Right. Well, in sort of the last couple of years of his life, he had major heart problems. Um, he really could not be as active in getting his ideas out. Right. And he had a transition to fundamental well-being. Right. Uh, and it's only enshrined in one place that I know of in an academic lit in the academic literature, and it's in the Journal of Transpersonal Psychology. And Stan Krippner, who's a very famous psychologist, was a young academic at that point, a young assistant professor on the panel with Maslow. Couldn't believe he was on the panel with all these famous people. Right. Um, and here's Maslow describe this, and he realizes, oh my God, this is a huge moment. You know, we have to make sure that his description of this, that his that his him basically admitting that he's had this, this transition to this other way of experiencing the world and his own firsthand description of it in, re in relationship to all of his other work is not lost. And so Stan like scraped the 25 cents that he had as a broke young professor out of his pocket and, you know, got, and got the transcripts from that, pub from, that, from that panel published in this journal just so that Maslow's part of that panel you know, would be published in that journal as well. Wow. Um, and so we have a record of Maslow actually talking about how he got it wrong and how um, he basically thought self-actualization was the highest level of human potential, but it turns out that that wasn't the case. And very late in life, he came to this understanding when he couldn't get it out there, when he was still the head of all the psychologists in America, he was still the head of the APA at right. this time. So still very prestigious, you know, still very venerated. Um, but just, you know, too weak physically, really, right, right. Um, to spread the word about his sort of final, if you will, <clears throat> discovery, which was this, that there was this other level of human potential right. that was out there that sort of transcended the previous level, which was like sort of the maximally developed ego, if you want, if you will. 
Right. Um, and then the next stage after that is kind of the ego losing its importance and even falling away entirely. And he never got to do much research on that like we have. We sort right. of picked up the ball from him. Um, and so I think that's a great thing that people can sort of go. They can find later papers that were written about, reflections on Maslow's stuff. You can search Google in that. And if you think, you know, that some of the stuff that's being talked about here today um, sounds a little out there. It's really not out there. It's grounded in one of the greatest psychologists of our time and, and his last sort of revelation of his culmination of his life work and all of that. And so the, yeah. another way to think about this evolutionarily is that we were, we're basically just animals, you know, and I think a lot of people don't like to think about themselves as an animal. But if you think about, imagine eating outside, you know, um, and, you know, maybe a bird lands near your table and you've got a little bread on your table or something and you toss the, a crumb of bird or a, cr a, ton of, uh, a little crumb of um, bread to the bird, right? What, what does the bird do, right? Does the bird peck at the food and then just kind of keep inspecting the food and looking at the food and analyzing the food and then take another peck? No, right? It pecks at the food and then it immediately starts looking around for what's going to kill it, right? <laughs> Again, and then it starts looking around for what might kill it, right? And then it pecks at the food right. again. Right? I mean, it's like, it's like it how takes I eat the breakfast. Briefest amount of time possible out of its life to nourish itself, and the rest of its time, it's like, what's going to kill me now, right? Uh, <laughs> sounds like marriage. <laughs> sounds, like, sounds like marriage, Ben. That's uh, awesome. That sweet. Might, we can get to that. <laughs> yeah, we can think about it. <laughs> we all have that same, every animal basically has that same programming, and humans are really no exception to that. And as we develop, we really develop like that bird, right. but from a different perspective, right? So it's our spouse comes home and says, I'm divorcing you and I'm taking everything, and it feels like a tiger is ripping our arm off, right? Or our boss right. looks across the table at us and says, you're fired, and not only that, you're never going to work in this industry again. It feels like you know, a leg is being ripped off right. or whatever else, right? It's because these old circuits, they're still in our brains, but they've been sort of shanghaied by yes. our <laughs> modern psychological environments. Did Maslow himself call, coin the, the phrase self-transcendence, or did he use that to describe his, late, you know, the, the very top of the, what should have been his pyramid that he didn't create? To keep what consistent with his model, he used the term the high plateau experience. Okay. Uh, you know, peaks of a mountain, and you think about, you know, if you're him and you're thinking, what's up there? Yeah. Um, well, you know, high plateaus exist in mountains and stuff, right? And yeah. And so he sort of, he used that method. Out. But he also created a, an, an entirely new field. You know, he was, he basically was instrumental in humanistic psychology, other forms of psychology. Um, and humanistic psychology is really sort of the cutting edge of psychology at the time right. that he passed away. Um, but him and um, a fellow named Tony Sittich, Anthony Sittich, um, founded basically an entirely new form of psychology based on what he based on this realization. They called it transpersonal psychology. So yeah, a lot of these terms were originally kicked around by him and Tony as they were trying to figure out how do you convey this to ordinary people. They ultimately settled on the official term of transpersonal. Okay. Um, but a lot of the other stuff, you know, self transcendence and high plateau and all of that, they all sort of come from, you know, other iterations, other, you know, earlier papers, playing around with it, you know, you know, stuff like that. Right. So that very top of the pyramid is where you then start your grayscale of multiple levels of, of development, I guess we would say, um, in being able to, you know, it's, I mean, like you said, it's not exactly like, you know, higher levels of attainment, but they're just different shades of gray of the things that, a that um, become real within you or that become realized within you. So now you've, you've delineated four different um, classifications that you talk about and then there's some that you don't quite talk about. Now, one quick question, are the ones that you don't talk about where additional functionalities within the mind have opened up within individuals that open hidden doors that humanity normally doesn't have access to? That'll be my first question. And then second, what are the four that you delineate in the finders for our audience? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. We can talk about, let's save the later ones for later so that we can oh. build to them. Okay. Um, Cause it just, it's like a logical progression of sorts. Sure. Uh, so the main thing that changes with location one and it holds true across the entire continuum is that that 
really that sort of genetic inheritance that we have where, you know, we're the bird constantly looking around for what's going to rip us to shreds right. um, that provides us with a psychological baseline that is really rooted in um, the best way to say it is a sense of fundamental discontentment, you know, a sense that in any given moment, th something is just not quite right. It might not, you know, it might not be throwing us into panic, but we just have the sense that something isn't quite right and we better be looking around for what that is or analyzing the current situation in our mind to figure out what that is, you know, or whatever else. And then what happens on top of that is that leads to a psychology that's rooted in a lot of worry and fear and anxiety. And this is what we call normal psychological experience of the world. Um, you know, people's normal, the average person's psychological experience of the world is not that positive, generally speaking. You know, they have this voice in their head. It's usually kind of a negative voice. Right. Nobody goes around talking about all of the negative voice that's in their head, you know, because that's just not cool to do in modern society. But when you stand in front of a room full of a thousand people and you talk about the negative voice in your head, like it's a thousand people nodding in unison, <laughs> you know, because there's this general recognition <laughs> about yeah. it. Um, and yet it's this unspoken thing. So in fundamental well-being in location one, the very first thing that happens is that that changes, that sense of discontentment fundamentally changes. It's like it just dissolves. And underneath it is a sense that everything is okay, is somehow fundamentally okay. Now, that doesn't mean if you're in location one, if your spouse comes home and says, you know, I'm divorcing you and I'm taking the kids and, you know, all of your money and whatever else, that you don't have negative, a negative emotional response to that. But it means that even in that moment of what we might call the most extreme psychological trigger, you can sort of look down, you can pause, and if you look down past all of that and you ask yourself, what is my psychological baseline right now? You find that paradoxically, somehow, things seem okay, even though at a more surface level, it seems like your world is falling apart. And it's, right. it's odd, right? Because you're like, why in the world should this moment feel like it's okay right now? Like nothing is okay from a logical or, you know, whatever sort of higher level standpoint at that moment. Right. Right. And yet, strangely, you have this paradox inside you. So that massive transformation is why I say it almost seems like a further evolution. Other things that go along with location one are um, a reduction in your, uh, that negative voice in your head, basically, what we would call self-referential thought. Right. Um, it's basically thoughts about yourself. And it turns out that most of the thoughts people have over the course of the day are about themselves. You know, like, geez, should I have worn the brown jacket? on you know sean's show or <laughs> should should i have worn a blue one or maybe i shouldn't wear a jacket you know all those psychedelic prints over there maybe i'm just like really wrong for you know all of these neurotic <laughs> thoughts that people normally have right about you know that just go on in their head all of the time those quiet down or at the very least they lose their emotional saliency they lose their emotional power right over them and so uh, people will say, you know, all of my thoughts went away. And, you know, of course, all of their thoughts didn't go away when you really dig into it. But what went away or, or what was really reduced in power was those self-referential thoughts. You have negative emotions that fall off much more rapidly. And so a great example is a car cuts you off in traffic. I heard so many research subjects use this over the years. A car cuts you off in traffic and, you know, you're no longer like following them for six blocks tailgating them, you know, trying to make them uncomfortable, making them feel like, oh, you pissed off the wrong, you cut off the wrong person here, buddy. Um, you know, it's like you may flip them off and have some choice words for them, but then there's like a time, you know, then it drops off right away and you're sort of going on with your life. Hey guys, we're going to jump back into the interview with Dr. Jeffrey Martin in just a second, where Jeff actually asks our resident SEALs how their consciousness expansion experiences that we had back in February have adjusted their perspective as Navy SEALs. That's gonna be an interesting portion of the conversation. But first, I wanted to point out that we are a viewer supported podcast. And so if you would like to support us moving forward on the little things that we have to buy or the travel arrangements that we have to make to make this show really cool, etc., cetera, uh, just stop by Patreon. Patreon.com slash TSAW for two seals and walrus. And then you can become a contributor for just like a couple bucks a month. Even will it help us out uh, because your contributions get added to others. And then all of a sudden that becomes a little bit of money that we can actually use for production of the podcast and paying for the bandwidth and things like that, that we really need to have happen for us to continue these awesome 
content deliveries to you. Back to the show. These are sort of some of the major changes that happen in location one. In location two, it's kind of more of the same. Okay. So in location two, you have a further reduction in self-referential thought, you know, um, an increased sort of tendency towards positive emotional valence um, and stuff like that. But something else kicks in at location two, and that is a perceptual change, commonly called in sort of religious and spiritual circles, non-duality. Um, and I think the best way to think about um, non-duality for people who are, who are sitting out there thinking, gosh, do I experience that? You know, what the heck is he talking about? Is maybe to just give you a little quiz. And so here's a way that I, in a real shorthand sort of way, you can tell sort of uh, if you're non-dual. Okay. Um, and to get a sense of like maybe what it's like, right? So think about just whatever you're looking at right now. Um, so maybe you're looking at the screen and it's this podcast. More likely, you're probably listening to this in the background or reading something in another tab of your browser, <laughs> or right? Because we all know what we do when we're watching these things. Um, <laughs> Maybe you're looking at a room or you're just looking at it. So maybe you're looking at somebody else, whatever it is, whatever you're looking at, I want you to just pay attention for a moment to how you're looking and ask yourself this question. How is that showing up for me? Is it showing up like it feels like there's sort of this something in here, something in my head that is looking out. I can tell there's like this thing. It's like there's some looker. There's a part of me that is a looking thing, right? And it's looking out and I'm here and it's looking at that page and that web page over there or that video with you guys in it over there or, you know, what, or the scene or this room or whatever it's looking at, but it's something that's clearly here and it's looking out at that page or whatever, that computer screen or whatever that's over there. Right. Um, or, is it showing up uh, sort of this way? You know, when you just sort of are looking, does it seem like everything is just sort of showing up? Like there's just sort of this, if you will, sort of field of visual perception or field of visual information. Just everything is just sort of there. And it doesn't feel like there's something here necessarily looking out of it, looking out at this thing that's over there, but it's just more like everything is just sort of showing up. Now, there's all kinds of different ways that that can appear so for instance it could be like it could be showing up like it's sort of out there but i'm still here right but it's still just kind of showing up out there and i don't have the sense of a looker or a seer or anything that's looking out um but nonetheless it's like it's showing up but still i'm here and it's all kind of out there but i'm still here or yep. it can be showing up where it's out there and i'm kind of just a part of it and it's all just sort of this one thing yeah um and so depend, those are all shades of gray in the direction of non-duality. So the traditional way is how vast majority of people in the world would describe their visual experience, which is it feels like there's something here looking out at something there. And then a non-dual perception involves, from a visual system perspective, basically involves just sort of that unified perception, that final example, where you open your eyes and everything is just sort of there. Or even if you close your eyes, everything is just sort of there, including you, including the sense of you, you're just a part of it. And it's all just sort of showing up as one thing. There isn't an I'm here and that camera's over there. Right. You know, it's just, it's paradoxically all just sort of seems like one thing. And so that type of major perceptual shift is really the hallmark of a location to experience in conjunction with the other things that I mentioned. Um, another thing that happens is, is that there's a sense in people that there's a right path or a right choice to make in mm. most moments and so like mm. your location two people will talk about well this just feels like what i'm supposed to be doing or this just feels right and it may make no logical sense you know to the other people who are present but to them there's just some very strong internal truth compass and they just feel like no no, no this is what i'm supposed to be doing right now i'm supposed to be making this choice or whatever else. Uh, and that's not, that doesn't happen so much at location one. It doesn't happen so much at location three and other locations. It's kind of a thing that's unique. Let me ask you a quick question on a tangent. Do you think that there is some, um, there's obviously going to be some nurture in that, um, in, in that equation, but is there some nature in that equation? Because there's a lot of people, for instance, um, who would probably assume, you know, because they can dunk a basketball, anybody could learn to be able to dunk a basketball. And I think that's true a mm -hmm. lot in consciousness expansion that a lot of, um, you know, for lack of a better word, enlightened folks or consciousness expansion folks assume that everyone can get there because they have kind of as a pseudo imposter complex um, rearing its head maybe the, to assume that absolutely everyone can 
can attain universal consciousness. But the two gentlemen to my right here on the sofa have kind of, from my perception, and maybe they'll correct me if I'm wrong, a natural predilection of being able to see everything as their existence simply happening and they have that driving inner compass within them to do what's right. Is there an is there a nature component to that where you just accidentally wired into that, you think? That's a that's a great question. I do think our research suggests that most people can reach fundamental well being. Um, I think it also suggests that at any given time, most people have sort of a natural inclination to one type of it more than others. Right. Um, and I certainly think that some people are the Michael Jordans of this space. Um, <laughs> where, you, know, they, no. um, you know, just I used to do sports broadcasting many, many years ago. And there was sort of a moment in time where uh, the crew and I were playing basketball before a game. And, you know, he basically came out and just humiliated us. <laughs> uh, he, was very, he was a very nice guy uh, he didn't mean to humiliate us but he was just like you know he was wanting to warm up and we, usually you clear the court and we didn't clear the court that day because he was like no 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 stay and he's like and we were playing uh, odd teams right and so it was like um you know we thought oh well you know there's you know a gap and there's like four and five right so we're like oh be on that team and he's like no 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 i'll just play you all <laughs> <laughs> We did not score a single point, <laughs> and he essentially scored at will. <laughs> we did not block a single point. We did not score a single point. So, you know, the security people in the stands and the people cleaning the stands before the event and stuff were laughing at us. Now, would you agree, Ben, that you're, you're kind of hardwired for this, you think? I mean, I want to, because basically what he's saying is God made me Buddha. <laughs> We're really humble over here. <laughs> Doug, what do you um, think? Do you I don't think know, there's some hard wiring in that? Or? So Ben and I have had this conversation. Yeah. I actually like to think that Ben and I became closer friends years ago, kind of because of this conversation and this interest in this realm. And I, I think Ben will agree that our, our opinion on ourselves, trying to analyze ourselves, is that I think I've had more environmental influence to create the wiring. And I think Ben's just had more innate wiring to create the experience. Okay. So you've gonna you've kind of went through the introspection path. Well, we weighed we weighed our perspective because we we're like creepy on the same page. You know, yeah, it just doesn't make sense to anybody, but you understand. Yeah, you guys like, are mentally wired. It's together. weird. Yeah, we we can not talk for a year and have the same exact lows and same exact highs to the point where it's like somebody is writing this down, right? Right. So, um, we Je talked about Jeff. We got a couple of subjects for you here. <laughs> we got a, um, we got a talking about it and what led to the to the mindset that we apparently share right and uh turns out there's a lot of impactful events that occurred that required some developmental conditioning which led to a completely abstract perspective on his environment which led to his mindset now and yeah i, I can give you sense. a really specific simple example without going in the weeds too is right. you know when i was like i think five i saw a friend my some some of my friends got like really beat up by like an older kid right and uh you know i always remember it, i always reflected upon it but i never connected that experience with hey maybe that's that, like impactful on how who i became yeah you know like Maybe I wanted to become a Navy SEAL to protect people who couldn't protect themselves. You know, and then I connect those dots. And I was like, duh, that makes total sense. Of course, like, I started reflecting upon that. And then the other point of that, too, that Ben and I speak to, and I'm curious your opinion on this, too. Um, you know, was I already li a little wired to be reflective when I saw some friends get beat up when I was five? And I didn't get beat up. And that was the thing that I always reflected on was, you know, why wasn't I, you know, picked on physically and, and punched and whatever? Um and so I th think for me, it's a combination of experiences and just kind of innate wiring. Okay. Jeff, what do you think about that? I think that all makes sense. I mean, again, you can be born a Michael Jordan, but you still have to learn to play basketball. And he still practiced probably more <laughs> I than love anybody that. else did. Um, That's a great analogy. So, and yeah, <laughs> sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but, and, but there are people, you know, that you do in some sense, potentially, I wonder about this, but it seems, to, it seems suggestive. There do seem to be people who just have a special knack for going really far out there in terms right. of the fundamental well-being sort of spectrum of experiences. Yeah. Um, and, or who are just very skillful at, you know, like, for instance, there's one guy that I know who's really a remarkable fellow. Um, and he pulls himself down to lower locations during the week so that he can run his company 
Yeah. And then every weekend he basically spends alone um, just, you know, sinking into PNSC and he shoots himself like a rocket out into these later stages right. and then reels himself back in for Monday morning. Uh, you know, the average person in PNSC is not, the average person in fundamental well-being is not able to do that. Right. Uh, there's something special about him. You, you just described my creative process, <laughs> like in a nutshell. Yeah, Ben, uh, Doug has a, has, has a startup company that he, that he works in technology, and he does a lot of internal thought experiments where he kind of shoots himself out there. And like, uh, I, I know you know Bruce Damer, who's a mutual friend of ours. He kind of does that same thing as well in that he shrinks his, his egoic self in his mind to the point that he then allows his mind to do whatever it wants to do, and he just kind of follows it along and then gets these ideas for the next science that he, he needs to do and then magically gets the cover of Scientific American for discovering or creating RNA, which blows my mind. But Doug does a, 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 a miniature version of that for his technology as well and kind of reels back in and becomes a human again during the week. Yeah, and what I've realized, too, is I've always kind of been like that. Um, and so once I leaned into it and kind of tried to dr direct it, uh, some really interesting things started happening. I came up with some interesting concepts that got funded, and you know now they're kind of the leading products for the startup. Um, so you know I think that goes back to kind of being self-aware enough to embrace or lean into who you are. Or, you know, if you're born Michael Jordan, you still have to learn how to play basketball. And I think that applies to any unique skill or ability. Yeah. Let's go on to, um, to position three and position four. What are those delineations? Yeah. So location three uh, is kind of the classic end of the Western Abrahamic traditions, mystical paths, uh, and also some of the Eastern stuff. And okay. it basically involves a transition. By the end of location two, more or less, you're in a positive emotional valence pretty much all the time. Right. You know, like if your parents die or something, you know, you're going to have some hit there. Right. Um, but, you know, without a major hit like that. Yeah. Um, then in location three, you, you really, your emotional experience transforms considerably and it primarily becomes about love and about sort of a combination emotion that is sort of a combination between love and joy and compassion. It can be some other stuff in there, but based on your um, cultural upbringing and, you know, stuff like that. Um, so it's got some flexibility, but it always seems to have that core. And so it's, um, it's dual again, even though people generally don't notice it. Um, right. And the reason that we classified as dual, and we're not the only ones, it turns out I was uh, talking to uh, John Hagelin one time. I was having dinner with John. We were supposed to speaking at the same conference. He's the guy who runs trans Transcendental Meditations organization, basically, I think in North America. Um, but he's run for president and you know, he's done all this stuff. He's an amazing physicist. And, um, and he was running me through a slide deck for the talk. He had this slide that was drawn from the Vedas and it had four levels. Um, and, you know, the first one was dual, like location one is. Yep. Second one was non-dual. Third one was dual. Fourth one was non-dual again. And our, wow. we see a pattern exactly like that in our human subject research. And I thought that right. was really fascinating. He's the only other place, you know, the only other person that I've ever seen that sort of had that. And he had yeah. it from their literature from thousands of years ago. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> that's so cool. When you can do something that you wind up like... You know, I wrote the I wrote the books, the Mind Hacking Happiness books, right? And so I put Easy together the model. I know, right? I got I got to plug <laughs> book my books. Plug. All right, so but I came up with the uh, the model of emotions that I just kind of you know eyeballed and put my thumb out there and said, okay, here's here's basically how all of our human emotions works. Here's how they're classified. Here's how the the soup nuts and bolts of how they come to be within your individual human mind, and this can be applied internationally to anybody who draws breath, basically. It's a it's a model that fits, and ironically, the really cool thing that happened was that um, the um, the the gods of of psychology and emotions, um, like Ekman and those guys, yeah, I mean, Eve Ekman and her father, um, Paul Ekman, like the gods of, of of emotion, came at it from the data side, and basically they are 
cookie cutter exactly the same. And so I, it was so nice to be able to say, yeah, I kind of put this thing together and explained how emotions come to be. And oh, by the way, here's all the pieces that they don't have. But the good news is their their model of emotions and their atlas of emotions is exactly the way I portray it in the, in the mind hacking happiness stuff. I was like, oh, that's so cool. Whew, thank God I don't have to make a case for, yeah, you know. It's really nice to have that second data point. I'm with you. <laughs> yeah, so having your work be, uh, be you know, uh, supported by thousands of years of, of Vedantic uh, history is, is amazing. So that's really cool. That was nice indeed. feel like there's a, in three, you feel like there's a, a union. The reason it's not non-dual is that you feel like there's um, a union or a merging with either the divine, a sense of the divine. Right. Some people get that. Some people get not a divine version, but more of a panpsychist version, which is a philosophy term mostly that right. deals with, like a sense that everything is conscious, uh, that or everything is made out of consciousness, or you know something like that. It's a right. thumbnail. Of that. It's a complicated area, but right. just to, to <laughs> thumbnail it. Um, and so people, it, I think it's fascinating because people who get the divine version don't usually switch over to the panpsychist version. People who get the panpsychist version don't usually switch over to the divine version. It's like maybe people are wired or programmed in certain ways, and they sort of go down one of these two experiential tracks. Like I've not had a divine experience in location three. My right. location three experience is panpsychic. Right. Uh, I don't have any idea what someone would call a divine experience. Uh, and that's even common for like some really famous spiritual teachers and stuff that right. I've had conversations with, you know. So, um, so further reductions in self-referential thought, higher well-being. You know, people report higher well-being than two, who report higher well-being than location one, who report, of course, a massive change in their well-being compared to being normal. Yeah. Um, and then location four, it's like you fall off a cliff in location four into what feels <laughs> sort of like an alien landscape. Uh, people will often say location three feels like the pinnacle of what's possible as a human. And then location four feels like you're not human anymore. It feels very alien. Uh, right. Your sense of agency, your sense that you can take an action or make a choice goes away. Uh, it just feels like the world is synchronistically unfolding. You're still doing stuff. I mean, you know, you're still watching yourself going around doing work or doing whatever it is that you're doing, but it, it doesn't really feel like it's you doing it. Right. Now, that can, you can have that sense at location two with its forms of non-duality as well, but this is like a much more, you don't, you still have some sense of agency no matter where you are. <laughs> right. In location two. Yeah. So would it, would it be fair to say that lo location two is somewhat a, I am me but you and everybody else and everything else in the world is also me and I'm interacting with it. And then location four is more of a, I'm the whole thing. Everything is doing what it's doing, including this thing that I used to identify as me. Yeah. And I think that that brings up um, some moral dilemmas for people, uh, especially for people that are discussing it. Right. Because I often, I used to, I don't use this analogy much anymore because it would kind of disturb people. Uh, but yeah. I'll use it in, relation, in response to sort of what you just said. And that is that from a location four standpoint, I mean, you know, somebody's across the street, they're about to get shot. Uh, the world feels so perfect and so as it is and so synchronistically unfolding or whatever that it'd be sort of like, well, you know, I have a lot of compassion for that guy who's about to get shot. Moving right. on. <laughs> right? Uh, hey, it's really it's funny and, and how they would define compassion is not how people would define it emotionally, you know. How, yeah. how you think about things like a compassion is different in one, two, three, four, and so on. Um so there's yeah. even that conversation. So you're getting into the wheelhouse of some conversations yeah, that we've man, had in this you're, in you're this room. Some nerves. Yeah. And we've uh, we've we've discussed the difference between uh, sympathy, empathy, and compassion and Ben made a pretty good point that, which is kind of housed in in position four, that you know. I'm so glad you said that because I was going to lay into you. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you got that one wrong just now, like when we made eye contact, I was like, I'm pretty sure Sean just understood what I thought. But yeah. if you said any other any other number, I would have just been like, son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, uh, it is it is definitely housed in position four in that you know he made a good uh, point because you know Doug and I are kind of of the um, of the camp that you know. Empathy is one of the most important things to develop as a human being in that uh, in a lot of position in a lot of humanistic positions, you need to have a feeling um, recognition. 
to be to be able to identify with someone's pain and be motivated through your nervous system to be able to then if you have the I want to help you component that creates compassion then act from a feeling perspective and Ben's position is more of one coming from a position four that says I don't have to I'm intelligent enough and can see enough into your pain not to have to put on your bullshit pain in order to want to help you and be able to help you understanding full well what your position is or your or your emotional strife is or whatever the situation is that I want to help you out of in, through a compassion perspective. And so we had that debate just recently um on this show and and Ben made a pretty good point that you know I had to come back after and say, you know, you know, it's almost like I have two different sides of my mind that want to agree to disagree to say, yes, I completely get Doug's position that you, for most people, you're going to need to be able to feel to have the motivation to drive your nervous system into taking action if you have the I want to help you component, which completes the compassion loop. However, um, I also see Ben's point that you don't necessarily have to put on the pain if you can understand it to the level of being able to break it down and see every component within it from a mental standpoint and still have the I want to help you component, which officially uh, classifies as compassion and be able to render aid. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. It's these types of shades of gray across these different emotional expressions and stuff that you see. Um, and that, you know, I remember, um, so I think you and I last saw each other at uh, a party that Rick Archer put on yeah. um, right, at uh, the SAN conference, around yeah. the SAN conference time, Science and Non-Duality conference time. Yeah. And I remember the year before that, I had helped Rick do a show for his podcast, which is mostly about people who experience this kind of stuff, if people haven't heard of it, right. um, that brought together all of the non-dual, not all, but a lot of the non-dual teachers um, from, that were speaking at that conference, which is mostly just a ton of people who are in location too, frankly. Primarily. Right, right. Um, and so... I remember thinking when Rick was first proposing that idea that I better bring like, you know, some gallon jugs of baby oil and whatever else. Because it was going to be just like a free for all. Yeah. Right? And I'm like, okay, you know, how, how am I going to make this more entertaining for myself while, you know, they're just fighting it out on this panel? I got some level four we'll ideas. Get, a, get one of those baby, you know, pools. We'll get some, we'll make a sport out of it. Um, <laughs> And I was stunned, frankly, that because when I was going around doing interviews 10, 12 years ago in that community, um, there was harsh criticism of those people towards each other. Right. Uh, you know, harsh criticism. And it was a lot around these types of topics. It was a right. lot because, you know, they were in slightly different parts of location too. So they had slightly different forms of non-duality. And it would be like, oh, well, you know, I'm the only real one that's in fundamental well-being. All of the other people that are out there, they're not really in fundamental well-being. And it would, you know, it would evolve around these feelings like of compassion or how love was showing up or how whatever, and, you know, they were listening to each other. They were tracking each other in most cases from a business right. marketplace type standpoint. Oh, yeah, right? yeah. Um, and then they were heavily criticizing each other in the most brutal ways imaginable. Oh, boy. Privately, behind closed doors, you know. Right, to, right, of course. And I can't say some people on that panel were research subjects. Some people weren't research subjects. Our research subjects are anonymous. Um, yeah. You weren't a research subject, so, you know, we can say that. So I'm, yep. I'm safe there. Yep. Um, and, and these differences, you know, it's these types of subtle differences, these types of subtle shades of gray across all of these experiences that I've led, I think, for millennia to strife um, around notions of this. And I was amazed when we were doing that shoot that people were so cordial to each other and so respectful of each other's viewpoint. And what, had, what I'd missed is that I, I helped a little bit with the first Science and Non-Duality conference, but I hadn't been back to one. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, I love Mauricio, I love the work he's doing, and Zaya, and what they're doing, and Nick Day was involved early in that and stuff. Uh, and those, they're fantastic people, I think that's great, you know. But what I'd missed is that something that their conference had, I think, done is forced these people for the first time to get together year after year in an environment where they couldn't be hostile. Uh, they couldn't sort of have <laughs> these hostile views towards each other because, you know, there's a live audience. Right, right. 
Yeah, it, you don't just want like one stage presentation to be dissing the next stage. Pres there, there had been a community, a cultural change in the non-dual, sort of what I would call the neo-Advaita community or the, or the modern non-dual, Western non-dual community of teachers. Right, right. Uh, that stunned me in, in how different these people were in interacting with each other than they were seven years ago, you know, seven years before that, or however long it had been since I'd made my research pass right. uh, through their community. And so I think on the one hand, yeah, there are, these, there are these very significant differences. But on another hand, what's happening is that a lot more communication is occurring between people. There's a lot more respect between people, a lot more acceptance of, okay, well, you're here. And you're a great example of it, right? In one studio, you know, you have three people experiencing probably three different, slightly different versions of this. Right. Um, and so it's like, you know, you, but you have a tremendous respect and you're able to have dialogues around it where not that long ago, I would say even a decade ago, those types of dialogues, man, I just wasn't seeing them. I was going across every community imaginable for our research. Yeah. And it was always like one guy dissing another guy about how, well, I, he's almost enlightened, but I'm the enlightened one. Right? Here's why. <laughs> how how, how non-dual non of yeah, your right. assessment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm enlightened as fuck. What's wrong with y'all? I think the There's, I think the sand conference is actually just a really big scale joke. Listen, They're like let's listen. put all the non dualists together and see if they disagree once. <laughs> listen, <laughs> there's more God in my head. <laughs> you know, I I, th I think you nailed it on the head. And you keep mentioning it, and I love that you keep bringing it in to the fold because I think it's important. You know, you refer to shades of gray, and I remember having a conversation with my parents a couple years ago when I realized that I had a vi very binary. Uh, way of not only viewing the world, but I had a very binary way of thinking. And once, and, and it's, at the same time, I kind of realized I, I am I am an emotional person more so than I realized, and I had conflicting emotions at the same time. Once I became okay with that, I started to realize, you know, shit, everything's everything's a grayscale, like, and that's okay. And I think that's so important to highlight. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, just yeah, not if you work for the government. <laughs> exactly. If you work, if we work for the government, and there are no extenuating <laughs> circumstances, whatever they said back in the '40s when they wrote it down, is that's what goes. Well, I think it's going <laughs> well, to. let me ask you guys: from you know, how practical do you think this state of consciousness is, or was, or would have been? I don't know when you transitioned in relation to your former professions, um, but how practical would this have been when you were? You know, I, you know, you got you you obviously, you know, SEAL teams and special operations teams in general. I don't know to what degree you're on the inside of it, right? But there, you hold this special sort of ethos or this special sort of mythos, I think, in the American imagination. And you know, what what we read about you are like the stories in Vanity Fair, where like somebody is stuck, kidnapped in some hellhole by some group in the middle of Africa. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, you guys basically sweep in like angels and take this American citizen to safety or whatever. You know, all the, it's not just like the war zone stuff. I think Americans have this other sort of view of you guys as sort of like America's guardian angels in many ways, sort of, you know, all around the world. But I wonder what you would say about, you know, this form of consciousness, this state of consciousness, this type of consciousness, and whether like you could absolutely never do that kind of job and be in it or whether it's ideal for it, or whether there are certain forms of it, certain types of it that are ideal for it, or have you guys, you must have talked about that or thought about that. I wonder what you'd say. That's a great question. Oh man, how much time you got? Funny, yeah, funny story. <laughs> oh, awesome, because this is a great question. Yeah, there's this thing on deployment called free time, and we do a lot of thinking and talking during that. So, uh, fuck, that's such a loaded question. But it's awesome. Uh, the, Having this perspective going through, probably wouldn't have gone in the military, to be honest, other than the the allure of the millions of dollars of education for a myriad of different skills. But other than that, I mean, I don't think I would ever bat an eyelash at the idea of going into the military with the perspective I have now. However, I mean, it's it was a catalyst for the for the synthesis of this perspective. So at the same time... Yeah, there comes a point of like when you're awakened, you say, there's not one moment of pain in my life that I would trade for absolutely anything because everything that has happened up to this point has led me to this exact to this point. moment. Right. Yeah, and, and there is absolutely nothing that I could change, else I risk not being exactly here where I am at integrity. this moment. Yeah, right, exactly. 
Doug, Doug, what do you have to say about? about oh man, so I can't tell you how much I thought about this, and I love that question because mm-hmm. the the answer I, th- I think cuts to the core of a lot of things. So I I think again, not honestly, not to piggyback off my last point about things being a grayscale and conflicting things existing mutually. Um, I, I think both are true. I think you a lot of guys. I don't say every single guy. I will say half to three quarters of them have a different sense of self or a lower sense of self that allows them to get through the training and i can tell you that that is absolutely true for me uh especially you know 3 a.m it's cold you know whatever wet and sandy it's like you kind of think you all you do is think about the guys and you know my hip was torn and i still remember thinking about the guys um more so than my own well-being as i hobbled around um with the torn hip flexor um at the same time if i had been if I spent less time fighting my own emotions and embracing them and exploring them, I I kind of, I don't know if I hate to say this, but again, you know, it's hindsight, so I, I don't think I would have gone into the military, um, you know, ha- being the self-aware that I am now, but at the same time, like Ben said, would I have gone down this path, this deep of self-exploration if I hadn't kind of been in the pendulum that swung this way? Um, so I think both are true without trying to... Oh, also, a, you wouldn't, a, you wouldn't a, have met me, and I peer pressured you into pretty much all of this. So. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's, that's a mother ayahuasca type of yeah. question. If tomorrow, you know, they came and said, "Oh, by the way, this document you signed says that we can pull you back into the military whenever we want," <laughs> uh, so we're doing that right now. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to place you in charge of the training command for you know. Oh, you they know, wouldn't do that. Would, would you, <laughs> It, would you think like, to yourself, luck, guys. you know what would really help these guys would be to have a shift into one of these states of consciousness? Or would you think to yourself, under all circumstances, I've got to keep these guys away from the state of consciousness? No, so I, I got I to jump into this. <laughs> Go, you take it. Because I went on a rant, actually, about this earlier, too. Is, you know, there's a, there's a sad and lesser uh, spoken aspect of uh, SEAL training is, you know, there's, there's more... More, more guys than there should be that don't make it through that end up uh, taking their own lives. Um, you know, they have this huge attachment to to that title of getting through the training and becoming a SEAL. That when that disappears, there's nothing left for them. And for me, that's the first thing I think of when you when you say that is, you know, I think we could save some of those guys. And you know, I, I know there was a guy in my class that took his own life. Um, and I, I think without even going out the deep end, that I think just that alone, you, you could save some lives. Mm. Wow. Yeah. So that would, that would be on the outside, that would be on the exit of training, rather than... I would begin think, it early on, because you, you, need, you need to be aware of it before <laughs> that internal struggle manifests itself. Okay. So you do think there would be some type of benefit to having this type of training before going through like a seal rotation to be able to step into meta awareness at at will and be able Mm -hmm. to see from an outside perspective or yeah i think there's there's two things that would happen i think you would see some people leave but then i think you would see healthier versions of people stay in yeah the the dormant or dead planet would reflourish like so uh yeah if you just like bully people into understanding what the tools are that they're going to use yeah. throughout this pipeline. Right. If you force it to be a prerequisite, like death by PowerPoint, just be like, hey, listen, this is what's going to happen to your brain like next month. Right. This is what you're going to be doing, whether you recognize it or not. These are the tools you're going to be utilizing. Right. You're going to be, you know, goal setting and doing positive talk and et cetera, et cetera. And and they really make them have a fundamental under like a testable fundamental understanding of it, right? And people wouldn't be figuring out who they are as a human and who they are as an operator in the same selection pipeline, while their souls being punished. They, everything would make sense, so they could really really take full advantage of the opportunity to figure out mm-hmm. what their what their caliber of person they are is. You know that's what that's for. Wow. Cool. So this is something you don't want to tell them at the end of life. <laughs> be like, be like, good luck. There was this research um, done um, in San Diego. At, I can't remember what that base is where they train the Marines to. Uh, they, they do the boot camp and stuff. Pendleton. And they were, uh, thank you. 
So they also, um, they did this brain stim stuff where they did uh, TDCS, which is just DC current applied to the brain in a certain way. And they wound up getting a learning, and it's very effective for motor skills learning. And so they wound up getting yeah. like a 30% increase in um, effectiveness of just like basic rifle training and stuff. Um, right. Marksmanship training or whatever, they, whatever their official term is for it. Uh, and what it was fascinating right. about that is that, um, you know, they really didn't dig too much into the subjective experience of the Marines that were in training or the Marine candidates or whatever you would call somebody right. after boot camp. Um, but then reporters became interested in this. And a reporter wrote a very famous story about it um, that popularized this whole thing. And she basically said that when she did it, it quieted her narrative self down and that that's what the thing was that allowed her to learn faster. Uh, in other words, she said, you know, ordinarily when I'm trying to learn something, I have all of this internal self-doubt, you know, that's like conflicting with the learning process. And she'd never realized that she had all that conflicting stuff in her head as part of her normal learning process before. And, you know, now mm. in, with this technology, it basically quieted that down. And she's like, it was like the information and whatnot could just pour right in with much less resistance. And so I, I could also see maybe some benefit from a training stamp. You know, we, what, what made me think of that was your thought about people don't have to figure out both things while they're going, while they're undergoing some, some course of training. Um, it, it might also be having figured that out ahead of time that it makes the training a lot more efficient. Well, I, um, I'm pretty well known for having zero breath hole capacity whatsoever. I mean, <laughs> as, as soon as I close my eyes to like put my face in the shower, I start chicken necking. Like, I just, I'm not good in the water. But um, during some pretty notable first phase evolutions, I, like I tied all five knots in the underwater knot tying evolution, which requires a whopping like 40 seconds of breath holding, but it seems like eternity for me. And then uh, on when I passed pool cup, I, was, I held my breath for so long that I got like basically almost written up for it, even though yeah. I passed. I mean, guys, guys have died doing that too, <clears throat> right? Just so like minutes of a breath hold, which I can't even, I can't even conceptualize. Yeah, and so you think <laughs> but, you get, you think you get yourself. It's very clear that there was something else taking place than my own personal assessment of my capability. And also that assessment in reference to the circumstances, et cetera, et cetera. Like there was something going on where a, a part of me that needed control had control. Yeah. And so you, you kind of got yourself out of the way. Jeff, would you say that's a fair assessment of, of what's going on scientifically? You get your, your default mode network kind of out of the way or your, your self-doubt circuits out of the way and, and just perform? Yeah. Yeah, sure. And of course that happens with flow too. So it could have just been a flow state, you know, that you entered into as so. a... So let's talk about TransTech. I want to be uh, really respectful of your time. We're going a little long here, but I wanted to talk about TransTech real quick in that you mentioned transcranial direct current stimulation. You're doing some transcranial magnetic stimulation. Is that a very focused magnetic stimulation? What, do you, what is it that you're working on that has gotten such a buzz going in consciousness expansion? Because this really interests me and I want to hook up when I'm out there next time. I want you to wire up my brain and zap me. Me. Yeah, you totally have to do it. Um, so what we're doing is we've done, we've done everything. Okay. There's no form of brain stimulation, you know, that's, that's external. It doesn't require us drilling holes in your head or something. Okay, um, good. <laughs> we don't want us to do because we don't specialize in that. Okay. Um, but there's really no form of it that we haven't experimented with. And right now we're experimenting with a very, uh, um, really the latest and greatest, which is transcranial ultrasound stimulation. Okay. And what we're doing is a number of years ago, say from 2009 to 2011, roughly, we collaborated. I'm not an fMRI person. I'm more of an EEG person in terms of brain measurement. And so we collaborated right. with different fMRI people all around the world to sort of get a picture of what was happening in someone's head when they were experiencing fundamental well-being and these different types of fundamental well-being. And it gave us kind of a map to hit, but we didn't have the ability to hit it with external stimulation. We could hit it with neurofeedback in an fMRI machine but that's expensive and rare and not practical. We tried a lot of stuff with neurofeedback in general, but there really didn't seem to be a way to make that widely accessible. So we began working with brain stimulation, and now we're finally to a form of stimulation that is actually able to reach right into the brain and activate those different places that were identified previously. And so for the first time, I think in human history, we're able to really stimulate 
um, someone and shift their fundamental well-being, deepen their fundamental well-being, um, as well as um, we haven't played as much with transitioning people. We've just done some proof of concepts around transitioning people because there's some complications around that. I mean, if you're in one state of consciousness one moment and it's normal and another state of consciousness in another moment, you know, there's just right. some protocol things that we really sort of need to work out. But I've seen enough, we've done enough piloting that um, I really don't have much doubt that uh, ultrasound is going to be used uh, to transition people. And actually, let me talk just a little bit about this because this goes to one of your earlier questions, maybe even your some of your earliest questions in this interview, and that is, are these states kind of organic things that, you know, just uh, are what they are, um, part of evolution? Um, you know, are they shaped more by culture, all of that? Well, one of the interesting things that we're finding, of course, in the book, in the finders, we have these categories, these types, and these types seem consistent around the world, across traditions, you know, spiritual and religious traditions, philosophical traditions, whatever, uh, across cultures, um, it does seem like if you do certain practices, um, you unwind your brain in a certain way and sort of rewind your brain and your brain circuits and stuff in a certain way that you get to a, an experience that's, that's pretty similar to what other people experience that do similar things. Mm -hmm. I long wondered whether or not those places that people got to subjectively in their experience, those rewirings that happened were a result were sort of the, the places that you would just get to naturally, no matter what, like that's just how this stuff has to show up. Or right. if it was something about the symbiotic relationship between the humans and the methods that they developed and, you know, where they eventually got to and whatever else. And we're really able to actually ask that question for the first time with this new brain stimulation technology. And we're able to say, is it really just these categories and are they what they are? Or can you take a little of one or a little of another one or a little of a third one and just sort of, you know, by directly stimulating the brain, create hybrid forms of these things that the brain can't necessarily get to on its own using only subjective experience and manipulation of subjective experience with meditation or prayer or whatever it is as a, as a technology. And what we're finding right. is that, in fact, you can create hybrid versions of these. And so I think we're not only on the cusp potentially of technology making this much more accessible, and I don't mean tomorrow morning by any stretch. I mean, it's, you know, right. half a million dollars or more a gear in the other room and expensive right. process with people with PhDs putting on your head and all that, right? Um, so it's not going to be in your living room anytime soon. Um, but it will probably eventually be in your living room and, or at least at a local clinic first or something. Um, and, you know, it's, and now we have sort of the, the knowledge that this isn't, a, this isn't, we all don't have to go to the same place because there's pluses and minuses of some of this, right? Like one of the things that people discover when they transition to fundamental well-being is a drop in motivation oftentimes. And there's like usually about a two-year cycle that's associated with that and things, you know, unwind and then they rewind. I, I can see you guys in the background being like, oh, that's not familiar. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You know, we can talk, I can talk a lot about that motivation problem and mitigations for it and stuff like that. But it's just this thing that you hit, right? But do you have to hit that? Right. You know, does that have to be a feature of the experience? And I don't think it does have to be a feature. There's, I think, memory. There's memory effects that come with this, right? Where, um, it, you know, your memories don't come up as often organically, spontaneously. Um, you don't encode things necessarily like you once did. Um, so we talk about that a little bit in the book. I think those probably can't be worked around. I think they probably are endemic to the process of, you know, a reduction in the, the sort of traditional form of the egoic self or whatever and the, and the transitioning to this other way of experiencing the world because that egoic yeah. self is basically a memory-driven self, right? right so it's right. not surprising that you would have reductions in certain types of memory as a function of shifting out of that. So I think there are some things that we probably won't be able to fix, quote unquote, if you will. But, you know, people will still make lists that are in this um, and, you know, <laughs> calendaring systems and, you know, stuff like that. Right. Um, but then I think that there are things that we will be able to to. I, so I think we'll be able to create even more functional versions of this as we move forward that really haven't been seen yet in human history. It's a very exciting time with this brain stimulation stuff. I think the world needs a push button enlightenment period. I mean, regardless of, of, you know, how they have to get there through technology or, you know, like we're, 
we've been dabbling, dipping our toe into the world of uh, entheogenic psychedelics and serotonergic uh, compounds and things like that on this end, just to put uh, some intellectual analysis to it. And for my own purpose to, you know, compare an endogenous experience to an, you know, exogenous entheogenic experience. You know, I think that no matter how you find it, I think it's it's just critical for society as a whole and as many people in the world as possible to to find these persistent states. Because, I mean, you know, obviously, it was the Dalai Lama that said you can't have world peace without inner peace, right? And I think that's a critical first step uh, for us to be able to attain that stuff. So I, I laud your your scientific prowess and your scientific exploration into this realm um we're gonna come see you and we're gonna get some stuff strapped <laughs> to our heads absolutely yeah. and uh <clears throat> and we're gonna be some guinea pigs for you to uh and we'll do another episode with you on your turf where you can show us all your cool tech and uh do man we just wanted to... later because we're seriously thinking of taking the core part of the project to china uh-oh. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, wait. Uh, Hold on. Get on a plane soon. Don't do that. Come out to where we are right now. I, I want one of everything you have first. <laughs> As well you should. Yeah, just get, just... smart. <laughs> There's a reason I live with it. <laughs> That's how I feel about my stuff, too. <laughs> well, Dr. Jeffrey Martin, thank you, thank you very much for your time today. I'm really glad that you were able to join us uh, via Zoom out here uh, from where you are in California over here for us in the East Coast to be able to do a live show with you. But we are going to come see you. Uh, really appreciate your time. Loved your book. Again, is there any place that people need to go to find out more about your stuff or to find out what you're doing? The research they can find at nonsymbolic.org. If they want to use, if they want to wake up, if they want to transition to PNSC and they want to use our protocol, um, we have a program that they can participate in, finderscourse.com. If somebody is watching this and thinks that they're in it, the book, but also um, there's a mini course that we made with the most important things for someone to know on the other side of transitioning to this. It's at explorerscourse.com and it's just like a free course. You can just go, it's like three hours of videos, but it covers the stuff that we think you know, if you've had this happen to you, like you should hear this out of our mouths uh, to help contextualize certain things and uh, stuff like that. Uh, so that's another that's another resource. Oh, he's frozen. <laughs> I was like, man, he's building suspense. He is building some suspense. <laughs> oh, well, all right. Well, so uh, here's the thing. Uh, we'll finish for for Jeffrey if you'd like. Uh, Search for his book on Amazon, The Finders. It's a really good read if you're into consciousness expansion and understanding the multiple levels of Maslow's very peak of his pyramid. If you want to understand the gray scales that exist beyond that peak and how science can measure those things. I thought that uh, discussion was amazing. That was great. I mean, he, he, he articulated some things that I think just were connecting dots of a lot of our points, you know? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Ben, what did you think? <clears throat> I'm excited to go uh, go pick up what he's putting down. Yeah, no doubt. Go get hooked up into his uh, technology out there for uh, mm -hmm. enlightenment. It's cool. Okay, so subscribe to this podcast. Hit the bell icon. We're only going to get you good stuff out on the internet. Uh, go to twoseelsandawalrus.com. Sign up for the email list because we're going to give away free stuff to the folks who have signed up earlier rather than later. We love you. Talk to you soon. Peace. Share this shit.